61 Chateau Lafleur. I can taste the Chardonnay in the palate. Did you sell one or more 1961 Chateau Lafleur Magnums? I thought it was a little forward. Who inspected these bottles? I've got an Elderflower Perfumed Juicy. Bright and leafy. This is that whole power of suggestion thing, right? Did you have any reason to suspect that the wine was counterfeit? Wine is alive. It's not a beverage. It's not a tool. It's not a table or a plate or a car. It's alive. Vous voyez comme les cèpes de vigne sont tout, tout tordus, tout tortueux. C'est assez original. C'est un type de, de taille en plus qui ne se fait pratiquement plus. On appelait ça la taille en gobelet. Avec le temps. Les branches ont poussé, puis ça fait un peu de, des statues. Euh, C'est assez fantasmagorique, euh, surtout à cette époque où il y a du brouillard. Mais euh, c'est aussi une partie de notre histoire. I am Laurent Ponceau, winemaker, vigneron in Burgundy. I was born above a cellar in this village in Moray Saint Denis in a family that is owning this winery since 1872. You feel here what I call the spirit of the vines. As soon as I started to breathe, I had the smell of wine. <laughs> and I can say I have some blood in, in my wine, not some wine in my blood. The spirit of Burgundy wines is unique with the name on the label representing not only a wine, but a culture and a history. What people are seeing, feeling behind the wine has no price. $1,600, quarter bitter, 105.3. Lot 982, Romanate Comte, 72, two bottles, wow, 9,005, 10,000. $10,000 bid now for these and 10. At $10,000, give me 11. At 10,000. $10,000 now for 10,000. 11,000 these now for 11. Give me 12. 11,000. $11,000 I have now at 11,000 in the orders. Boom, 1019. I guess the auction scene really started in the 90s in the dot-com boom. Everybody was making money. 
there developed this culture of very wealthy collectors uh, gathering at these auctions to see and be seen, uh, to be seen bidding. Uh, the prices started to really escalate. 5,005 go six. 5,005, last call at 5,500. Pass then at 5,500. 987. I started to get these emails. It was strange. I couldn't really figure out where they were coming from. They described these evenings where these guys, very wealthy collectors, were drinking like 1945 Romani Conti and 1955 Petrus, you know, really, really expensive wine. I eventually learned that these emails were coming from John Capon, the head of the auction house, Acker Merrill Condit. Cape One's notes are very colorful. He had these unusual descriptors, trying to make the whole tasting note more interesting and developing new metaphors. This culture kind of reached its apogee under the auspices of Acker Merrill Condit and this group called the Angry Men all of whom had nicknames like Mr. Angry and Big Boy and Hollywood Jeff. We missed the tequila party last night, but you know. I think it was worth it. It was worth it, yeah. I drank a lot of that 1907 Madeira last night. It, was, it had a lot of layers, that, that wine. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was coconut, it was nutmeg, espresso. Yeah, it was, it was really Exciting. layered, wasn't it? I think the 88 has so much acidity, uh -huh. it's, it can be incredible. But it's a more hit or miss vintage. Than the 88 that. has a huge amount of acidity. No, that's absolutely right. 96, though, is the vintage to buy. For anyone out there, buy 96 champagne all day. If you can't afford that, buy O2. If you can't afford that, drink fucking beer. The best way to taste high-end wines is with a group, because there's power in numbers. Thank you. Wines are really, really expensive, and so our group meet eight times a year. Each time, one member hosts and does the wines from his cellar. Thank you guys drink too much together. <laughs> Where the Angry Men name came from is you get invited to a wine dinner, and you bring a really nice, a great bottle of wine, OK? and everybody else brings shit wine, bad wine. And so you get very angry. And <laughs> it was men who didn't want to be angry anymore, and everybody had to bring it, you know? You had to really bring it. Thank you very much. My entry into Burgundy was Rudy Kernuan. There was an angry man that Rudy had invited me to. And that's where I met that whole gang. Their dinners were always over the top crazy, breaking it out with like 100, 200 grand worth of wine in a, in a night. It was pretty extraordinary. What these guys actually had, it's what Americans call fuck you money. Well, I got a $3 million bonus. I'm going to take a million of that and blow it. And that's their fuck you money. They're going to do whatever they want with it. They don't care. There's no consequences. And it's a, it's a ki kind of money that most human beings never experience. Uh-oh, here she comes. <laughs> the fine wine world, it's really mostly men. Especially when I was younger. I'd walk into the tastings and everybody would immediately ask, you know, whose date I was. But I had an important job. I ran a major auction house in New York. I bought like $50,000 worth of champagne in the last auction for one of my clients because his daughter's getting married. So we have... It was 2000 or early 2001. We were doing auctions, and I started being aware of this kind of, you know, skinny, geeky, young guy that liked wine. At the time, he was somebody that was bidding on Paul Meyer Merlot. Paul Meyer Merlot sticks out in my mind with Rudy. You know, high-quality wine, but, you know, it's got one zero, not four zeros. Oh, 16, 17, $1,800. 1800 for the single bottle of Latash, 1985, 1800 $1,800 bid. 
at 18. What was really strange was 18 months later, he reached out to me on the telephone and said that he wanted to meet with me because he wanted to be a player in the auction scene, which I found kind of odd because he had just been a geeky kid drinking California Merlot. Can you, can you help? Where's his phone? Hey, what's up, Rudy? Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? How are you, man? Very well. Good, good, good. I brought some wines uh, for us to drink. Can you, can you help me? Yeah. His breadth of knowledge seemed to be pretty extraordinary. He actually taught me, you know, almost everything I know. He was a real cult figure, and everybody talked about him. Ciao, bello. He had this mysterious background. Where did he come from? Part of what created his mythology was he had an extraordinary, who has an extraordinary palate, um, the best palate of anyone I've ever met in my entire life. Any wine, from California to France, any type of wine, any vintage. Rudy was extremely, insanely, unbelievably correct on all the wines. The art of blind tasting, it comes naturally, but you have to make an effort. You know, you really have to work at it. You taste wine blind, you identify the wine, and you know, it's, that's the badge of honor for a sommelier. Do a little swirl and just see if it's any, anything unusual with the alcohol. Look at the legs, how slow or fast they fall. You smell it and then it kind of just tingles off senses to your brain. And then you look through your Rolodex in your mind of all these different wines you've tasted. And I'm thinking, I'm like, what could this be? I think a wine palette is very similar to athletic ability. Sorry. Wine tasting is a lot about knowing the vocabulary and being able to express, using that vocabulary to other wine tasters, what it is that you're experiencing. I totally get that peppery citrus that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've met Rudy. Tony! Tony, what's up? What's up, Tony? I met him at a tasting. I was very, very impressed. He identified almost all the wines blind. He must have learned by drinking an enormous amount of different wines. Um, but that's the only way to learn. He always wondered why and how. That's why, you know, you know, 18 months, and now I have, what, yeah. uh, Pretty much like 3,000 bottles of wine, you know. We're gonna make a booklet, you know. That's it. Yes. Rudy's Adventures. <laughs> I met Rudy first in 2004, I believe. There was a luncheon for one of the producers, and uh, we quickly became friends. He was very warm to everyone. I really liked the guy. It's fun because there's a lot of wines today that I haven't tried. So. We hung out a lot and we went to wine dinners. How are you doing today? Good, man. Tired, but Long good. Trip? From 5 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> Long trip. 14 hours drive. Where'd you drive from? L.A., man. <laughs> L.A., man. The people in this town, excuse my language, are full of shit. But not with Rudy. Just wakes me up, you know. Nothing he did was short of real class, warmth, and graciousness. You like, you like everything so far? <laughs> For my birthday, he gave me a bottle of, I think, a Paul Roger 49 champagne, which is in incredible. What do you have right now? Colgan. Interesting. Yeah. Very different from the, uh, the uh, um, Herb Lamb. Yeah. I don't know, it's 100% calf because he just was a lover of wine, is a lover of wine. Uh, I keep talking in the past because it's just still very strange. He never said something to me that I could look at and find was untrue. But he didn't ever say that much. I was a reporter and I was curious about the auction market. And I sat there at the back of Christie's and I noticed a very, very young man spending a lot of money. 
surrounded by people that I knew were movie producers, clearly the focus of everyone's attention. That's a story. Who is this guy? And why is he spending this kind of money? And what does he want to do with his wine? Today, I can't. Today, it's overbooked. Tomorrow, call me. I might. It took months to get him to sit down and have a cup of coffee with me. I, mean, I got to go in five minutes. I have a big burgundy tasting. Let me move around. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Let me uh, have the honor to try my wine. It nice. was like another month or two before I got him to sit down and actually have an interview with me. He proceeded to serve some of his great wines. Oh my God, this is, uh, it's corked. No. <laughs> he lived with his mother in Arcadia and uh, the people around him would say that his family owned the Heineken distributorship for all of China, fabulously wealthy, and he was on a million dollar a month allowance for his wine. And when I asked Rudy about this stuff, he said, I don't talk about my family. And he wouldn't tell me anything. I sort of assumed he was a rich kid looking for something to do. The auction houses were giddy. No one had ever spent that much money that fast. It was ruining the quiet little club that the old guys had. I've been collecting for 38 years, I guess. So I've got, you know, lots of DRC labels, and they're all categorized by particular domains or groups of domains. There's Ponceau's in here I've got mostly from the 80s. That's a major wine. Yeah, that's his, one of his best. Sometimes you only get to taste them once in your life if you get to taste them at all, so it's kind of fun. I was introduced to Rudy by John Capon at an Acker auction event over in Beverly Hills. I wanted to drink Burgundy. That's, that's me, of course. No. He said, well, you're a Burgundy collector. What Burgundies do you like? I said, well, my favorites are probably Rumier, Rousseau, and DRC, Romani Conti. That's you it. got that right, my friend. You got that right. Right after that, he said, you should buy wines with me. He said, I buy cellars and collections in Europe all the time. And then I remember Rudy asked me, what's the oldest Rimier you've ever had? And I said, it was 1969. And I told him that I'd been lucky enough to find a couple at auction that they're real hard to find. And then Rudy said, well, you know, in the last year, I've had 1945, 1949, 1955, and 1962 Rimier Bonmar. He picked the greatest red burgundy vintages from that era. I was just flabbergasted. I had been looking for him for 25 years. Burgundy is unique on the planet. A band of slopes, so to say, which is 70 kilometers long on one kilometer wide and composed by 1,250 different appellations. Cette année, il y avait beaucoup de raisins et on verra si tout ça va tenir le coup jusqu'au vendange. Le paradis, paraît-il, est, est là-haut. En Bourgogne, je pense qu'il est plutôt en bas. Il est en bas par les racines et par les caves. We are just uh, 11 meters below the ground level here and we are really the two feet in the history of, of Burgundy. See here are uh, tiny roots from vines, which are probably here since 200 years. The vine is sucking, so to say, the rock. Going up on the hill on the other side of the street, the vines will not find the same mineral elements, and they will never find the same taste and aromas. The most important for me is what nature gives. We are only a tiny element of the chain. If one element breaks, the chain is, is broken and, and uh, you cannot reach the glass of wine. Wine is the expression of place. And Burgundy is the ultimate example of this. It's a wine for obsessives. 
someone who really knows their stuff can tell you the difference blind between something that was grown here and something that was grown 40 feet away. It's really they, good. They, oh, look, at, look at where the fill is. Fucking uh, incredible. This is probably insane. This is where I go crazy. This is my crazy, this is my crazy spot. I get nervous and my blood pressure goes up. It's the ultimate existential art form. It's living in a bottle, it's alive. And then you drink it and you absorb it into your body. It's art that you, becomes part of you, literally. Well, that's Ponceau, who's a great producer. Hey, Carl. Hello. How you doing, babe? Oh, I'm good. A lot of good shit here. You have a few drinks and you come here and spend 100 grand on wine? It's him. This is the place. <laughs> this is the place, yeah. <laughs> They're very, very reasonably priced. Where can you get a 61 white for 600 bucks? From 1961. This is crazy time. Yeah? Uh, yeah. 1990 Romani Conti. This is maybe one of the greatest bottles ever made of wine, right here. 20 grand, maybe? 20 grand. He knows his prices. 20 grand for the bottle. And you want this. If, you're, if you like wine, you. You need this, you want this. But you have to decide, do you want this or you want a Prius? Yes, exactly, you trade it for a Prius. When we drink wine, we don't look at the price value, you know, we, we, we look yeah. at what we get from the wine, the excitement, you know, the, the passion, the way they make the wine and everything. It's, it's not about the, the price of the wine, you know. Some people... Rudy like, was, was very generous with everybody. I had some of the greatest Romani Contis with him, you know, I've, I will ever have. Who wants to drink wine? At the time when all this was happening, there was a huge demand for old fine wine. As a whole, Burgundy very quickly went from affordable to unattainable. I guess you can call it the Rudy era. It's, it's very fine sediment, so stand them up and then put the ice. The economy was booming back then. There were such tiny quantities of Burgundy worldwide. It wasn't enough to satisfy the thirst. It was all about liquidity, and it continues to be. And any time there's tremendous volatility in a market, and all asset classes move the same. Dave, your go-to seller is pretty good. You got some good stuff in here. So many of my friends in finance collect wine, because when you watch stocks all day on Bloomberg, right? and then you can see auction prices move. There's a certain pride to getting a good buy. Today, there is no relation between the prices and what is in the bottle. When I sell a bottle a 100 euro, I see this bottle when it's released at 1,000. How come? Dude, I just opened that bottle on Thursday. Now I feel bad but open it. It's a cost of the bottle. <laughs> can, I, can I refill and put the pork back? <laughs> it was clear to me in very short order that he had revolutionized the wine market. Prices were skyrocketing. I thought it was a pretty smart little racket. He was cornering the market in a lot of these wines. What a clever thing to do. If you have a lot of money, go in, buy up a lot of wine, drive up the prices, and then start selling at the new high price. There was one other guy there who was always bidding furiously against Rudy, and that guy was the representative for Bill Koch. Collecting has to have an emotional meaning to me. Part of it is, is the detective story of tracking it all down. I've collected uh, impressionistic art. I've collected uh, samurai swords, silver coins from Greece. I have some antiquities, I have some sculpture. And I've collected wine. You want to see my wine bathroom? A bathroom is generally a bathroom, but I thought it'd be more fun to make it interesting. So we put wine crates here, wine labels, corks on the ceiling, 
And then if you look over there, there are wine bottles on that wall. My secret wine opener, wine opener, not wine opener, cellar opener. Come on in. I've been a little obsessive about buying wine in the past. I have in total 43,000 bottles with super fine wines. You could taste the love the vintner had in making it. And that, to me, is almost a religious experience. You know, where we collectors like precious things. Love is extremely precious. What price can you put on uh, the love of your wife? What price? Well, if you're getting divorced, you can. <laughs> but here's one bottle of Jefferson wine, 1787 Lafitte, THJ. I'll set it down on the table. We'll line them up. The reason I wanted to buy four bottles of Thomas Jefferson wine is very simple. The mere fact that Thomas Jefferson owned it and held it in his hand, et cetera, et cetera, is, that's part of history. Here's another one, 1787 Mouton, again, THJ. Look at this bottle. Isn't it beautiful in and of itself? 1737 Lafitte Chateau Rothschild. The faker didn't know his wine history very well because the Rothschilds didn't own Lafitte in 1737. Unfortunately, I paid $100,000 per bottle. The rogues gallery. Well, the first time I think I found a fake wine, it was because of the weight of the bottle. There was a bottle of Petrus on the back of the table, and I reached to grab it, and when I lifted it up, I almost threw it on the ceiling because it was so light. This has a 75 CL in it, yeah. but it's a 1929. Yeah. That only started with the 1930 vintage. You're looking for anomalies. Is it in the right glass? Does the cork have the right stamp? Is the cork properly aged? Is the paper correct? Yeah, everything's pixelated here. I wonder what the sediment in here is. If these things have allegedly been together for the last 60 years, they need to look like it. Oh, that is one hot mess. If the capsule looks like hell, and the label looks pristine, that doesn't work. You know, that's got a 95-year-old's face on a teenager's body. You know, you always want to be careful with these online auctions because you never know the provenance. They just want to sell. Really, it's a hard. Ah, I think bottles cork, man. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I love doing that shit, you know. At the time, fake wine was just starting to be talked about. Rudy was quite the expert on fake wine. And when I asked him about it, he said that he'd, had, he'd bought so much fake wine that he'd had to become an expert on it. No, they won't tell you the summary history, you, but you sometimes if they doubt the bottle, they put the picture of it. So you be the judge. Okay. You look at the picture, you want to take it, you need it. So they don't they have would... anybody that's out there looking at no, no, no. conditions and... Really they, they actually do. Talk about Acker auctions. You do it, Audrey? Oh, no, we're live. We're live. Yeah. We love it. Acker is great, man. We love John. <laughs> he and John Capon were meticulously going through all of his wines to catalog everything and sell some off. John Capon was the son of a very nice family run wine store in Manhattan. Shopping for anything during the holidays can be simply maddening, and shopping for wine is no exception. I'm here at Acker, Merrill, and Condon, the oldest wine store in America located in New York City. Acker Merrill wasn't a big house. They were a store that got into the auction world, and then Rudy really made them. John really turned it into a fun thing. He was the first one to, like, break it out. It was like a giant crazy party with an auction. At the same time he was doing that, Rudy came along with this incredible seller, and they kind of helped each other. When Rudy was drinking California Merlot, Acker Merrill Condit was in last place of all the auction houses. 
When Rudy sold $35 million worth of wine through Acromero Condit and two sales in 2006, Acromero became the number one auction house in the world. He is the CEO of Acker, Merrill, and Condit. And this year, he has auctioned off more than $100 million, the first wine house to do so. John Capon joining me. So you can't whine about that revenue rate. Get it, wine. John, you're going to leave now, aren't you? All right. Well, it's been a pretty crazy year. There is not much that can be said about this collection outside of the fact it is one of America's greatest. This is a collector that actually inspects his wine. To see all the magnificent wines in there, I said, man, this is a wine collector's dream. I felt like maybe I ought to buy the whole bloody cellar. You know, the auction is a complex transaction. You get a catalog, it's 300 pages long. You have two weeks to make up your mind. You may win, you may not win. Some people they were selling massive amounts of wine. And, you know, I don't know how John could have inspected every single bottle when he's selling $30 million worth of wine. The fakers like to fake the very hard to find, very old wines, because you get them a much higher price. One night, my bulldog investigator, Brad Goldstein, found that I had just paid 25000 for one 1921 Magnum Petrus. In 1921, Petrus made no Magnums. You got to go, big guy. You got to go. You want to go? You want to go get mommy? Come on, come on. Bill kept saying to me, I want to know how deep this problem is in my cellar. Where's the Ponceau's? Where are the Ponceau's? I don't see them. We had to find experts that knew about corks. We hired a guy who knew about labels, capsules, glass, and even looked at the glue. You know, on an 1858 bottle, we found Elmer's glue. And Elmer's glue didn't come in until sometime in the 70s. Here, see if you could spot the uh, inconsistencies there. You know, the more we learned, the larger the epidemic became. I have over 400 bottles that are proven fake, for which I paid $4 million. I think what spurred Bill on was when the auction houses told him as they say in French, tant pis, you know, tough luck, buddy. You bought it, you bought it as is, you're stuck with it. For some reason, you know, Freud can answer why. I just hate being cheated. In the wine business, there's a code of silence. I'm not taking this. We were fairly certain that some of the wine bottles that Bill had purchased from Acker Merrill were without a doubt counterfeit. He tasked me with finding out the information on this Rudy Kaniwan. I was given video of, of Rudy in early 2000 doing what was going to be a food show on wine. I almost fell out of my chair when I first saw these videos. Can I, can I refill and put the fork back? <laughs> the motivation behind the investigator is to, um, is to show the elegance of the hustle. This is the catalog of the auction, April 2008 in New York the page to present the Maine Ponceau. And when you see the pictures here, there is a 1929 Claude La Roche. Ponceau started estate bottling in 1934. So first of all, in the catalog, it was already wrong and fake. Everything here also is fake. This wax we never used. We never sold any wine to Nicola. We never had this vintage printed uh, outside the label here. And close on the knee, close on the knee, close on the knee, 45, 49, 66, and 71. And we started to produce the close on the knee in 1982. So, and here you have the 99 points from the expert. And the expert is GK, John Keppen. This is the auctioneer. So, how can the expert be 
such an, a, a good uh, expert on wine, which cost 50,000 to 70,000 dollar, because he earns 20% on it. When you find a fake wine, it's a dirt on the integrity of Burgundy. And I wanted to wash it. So two days later, I jumped into a plane and I flew to New York. I wanted John Kempon to withdraw everything. The stock market is now down 21%. Dow traders are standing there watching in amazement. I don't blame them. This could be the most serious recession in decades. And that means life, as most Americans know it, is about to change, in some cases dramatically. Bear Stearns had collapsed the week before the auction. So there was some question about, you know, what was going to happen with the, the, the market. This particular auction was just a wild affair. We were all really, really buzzed on a really expensive wine. Things get so raucous, you know, halfway through the auction, you know, Cape on his bang his gavel saying, shut the fuck up, guys. You know, I mean, this is not, you know, this is not Sotheby's. <laughs> I happened to recognize a guy who came in and sat at the back of the room, and, and he was not part of the merriment. You know, sort of like Banquo's ghost. Suddenly, Ponzo stood up, and there was silence. He said, withdraw my wines, and, John, and everything John like was at the podium. It was a bizarre moment. Capon announced the entire 30 odd lots were being withdrawn. At the end of the auction, I met Capon and I was asking who are the owners of these wines. The next day, I met uh, Rudy Kern and went for the first time. Jean-Georges. I had no idea of uh, what would happen. He was just the owner of the wine. That's it. My two options was he didn't know or he knew and he wanted to sell it. And this is not nice. But that's, that's After hello and so on, <laughs> I said, oh, look, now. You have to tell me where the wines are coming from. He's, he's not, he's not going to have food. You bought these wines, you, you should know. I buy a lot of wines. And I, oh, you I know, we buy so many wines. I buy so many wines, said uh, Rudy, uh, that I don't know uh, where they come from. I have to check. That's why I love wines. You know, wines, you, you can never tell. You can never tell. I had the idea that Rudy, he was doing a lot of dinners and parties, trying to have uh, every client as a friend. So I said to myself, I'm going to do the same with him. Let him think I will become his best friend. And then he will maybe talk. We had assembled a team of international talent. It was actually um, a former CIA agent. Um, sorry, guys. Percy, you're looking for food. I got nothing for you. Percy, get out of here. We had received some information about his immigration status. This is the 2003 US Department of Justice removal proceedings for Rudy. He was living in the United States with a warrant out for his arrest. He's going, um, have you done any trip? No. <laughs> to the one countries? No. He did. At that point in time, his student visa had run, and if he leaves the country, he'll never get back in. You know a big traveler? You don't like traveling? Oh, I like traveling. I love traveling. Oh, putting a sugar addict in a candy store. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love traveling. I, I love traveling. One of the letters 
to Homeland Security had the name of the business that Rudy and his brothers used to obtain visas to the United States. We took that letter and we went to this location, Jalan Gajamaja Plaza. It's a series of small shops in Jakarta. One is a, like a hardware store. It's like a hardware store. I have been insisting on, on emails, and uh, he said, OK, well, uh, I didn't find out yet, but um, I, I promise I will give you that. A month and a half later, he gave me a name. I found out I bought the wines in Jakarta, and it has been sold by Mr. Uh, Pak Hendra. This is the only information he gave me. I flew to Los Angeles, and uh, I invited him to dinner. Again, very quickly, I asked him, now, Rudy, face to face, eyes into eyes, tell me the truth. Who is this Mr. Pakendra? He's a great guy, great, he has a great palate, been drinking for the last 20, 30 years. And he took his cell phone and he wrote two numbers in Jakarta, so I was happy. Then we had a nice dinner. Great food, great wine, great people, great ambiance, perfect. Can't ask for more. The next day I tried to call the two numbers. One was a fax machine, and the other had no answer at all. We had heard Rudy had just met a French vintner and gave him two phone numbers and the name of an individual who was his source. I immediately had our former CIA officer run him. The first number came back to an airline, Lion Air, the largest airline of Indonesia. Not a, a big wine collector. <laughs> and the second number came back to a strip mall, Jalan Galamaja. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. We knocked on every door. None of the people in the locations had ever heard of Rudy Kurniawan or his father. Everything with this fellow just kept coming up fake. When I came back to Europe for this dinner, it was time to focus on my harvest and, you know, I'm a winemaker. Okay, I don't look like a winemaker, but I am. <laughs> I started to investigate again at the end of the harvest. Then I decided to go to uh, Asia, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, and Taipei. I wanted to know who is Pakendra. Rosemary. I go very often to Asia, and I know very well Asian people. 
And I have to tell you that the wealthy people from Jakarta are coming to Singapore and Taipei to have fun. So I knew a lot of these people from Jakarta. And I would ask, do you know of Mr. Pak Hendra? Finally, I found out that Pak means Mr. and Hendra is like Smith. So this is the most used name in, in Indonesia. <laughs> So I would ask, do you know a very rich family uh, importing beer that uh, would have a son in uh, California that would love wine? Nobody knew about a family like that. So who is Rudy? He didn't talk so much about his wealth, but he didn't have to because it was obvious. I met his mother, was a wonderful lady, and I met his brother. And your brother, you know, he's, he's uh, in the last two months, he's been here eight, ten times. He doesn't want to go back. He was very businesslike, very nice, but Rudy was very outgoing and <laughs> just the opposite. I got, I got to cut down a little bit on drinking and eating like this every week. <laughs> I spent three Christmases, Christmas Eves, with he and his mother. She was very old. She did not speak English. And he was clearly taking care of her. We always exchange. We I always exchange. Risotto, Dar seemed very much like the big brother who was running the business back in Asia and giving Rudy an allowance. From my point of view, he looked up to his brother, and his brother could say, hey, if you screw up, then I can cut you off. That's the perception I got. Dar didn't strike me as a criminal. That's why he mentioned it. What's your favorite Al Pacino movie? Scarface. <laughs> My name is James Wynn. I was an FBI agent for 30 years, 26 of which were spent investigating cases involving the theft of art or art fraud. Well, I've read the Idiot's Book on French wine. That's how I started. My background is financial, and this, in a lot of ways, is a financial crimes investigation. One person described Rudy as having a never-ending reservoir of needs. He ran like $16 million through his American Express account. Rudy had a number of very nice cars, an Italian sports car, a Mercedes SUV. He had purchased a mansion in Bel Air, California. He was buying contemporary art. He had Damien Hirst. He had some Warhol. All of these trappings go into creating Rudy. He was like the Gen X Great Gatsby. You put me in big trouble, man. I'm on diet. The persona established by Rudy was that he was a trust fund baby, very wealthy, sent to the US to care for his mother, was earning an allowance from his brother who was running the family companies. I was unable to establish any of that as being true. Based on my review of years of bank records, I see no evidence whatsoever that he was receiving trust fund proceeds from his brother. I always said that. We always said that. The right wine, the right food. Let's toast. Let's toast. What emerged for me was how desperate Rudy was for money. He's putting people off, putting people off. He has a deadline. He's supposed to pay someone. and he's procrastinating because he doesn't have the money. It's almost like a shell game. You know, he's borrowing money from here to pay over there. All the activity involves wine transactions and or loans and advances he was receiving from clients of one of the auction companies. Do you see wine as a good investment? It's a great investment. I mean, historically, it's been one of the best investments on, on par with gold and uh, Acker, like a lot of auction companies, offer advances in anticipation of sales. Beautiful thing about wine is that people actually drink it, so there's less bottles every day or every week of some of the world's greatest wines. So it's naturally 
kind of puts pressure on pricing automatically. This was a way to beat out other auction companies that might be competing for Rudy's business. At one point, you know, Rudy was obligated to Acker for almost $10 million. Show me your answer, please. Just tell me what's all the truth, the whole truth. Let me look for some healthy guy. I do? I do. Thank you. Can you please state your name for the record? Rudy Cornell one. Uh, let me cover some ground rules just so that you know. Right. Have you been deposed before? No. So it's important that you speak audibly. Oh, okay. Sorry Because the that. court reporter is trying to write down what you're saying, so he can't write down nods of the head. He needs words. Okay. You understand that? Yes. Mr. Kurniawan, who inspected these bottles? Well, we basically have, um, we basically drank a lot of these bottles with uh, a lot of different people, uh, including uh, critics, experts, auction houses, and whatnot. We tried to press Rudy for the source of his wine. We were looking to build our case and file against him. That John doesn't want to take it, it could be fake, it could be counterfeit, and, and, but He's not sure. I'm not sure. I don't believe so. So I agreed to take them back, which is the right thing to do. He wasn't defensive. He was guarded, but, you know, friendly. He was, he's a hail fellow, well-met kind of fellow. Uh, do you speak French? No. And do you write French? No. Just merci. <laughs> Never definitive, nothing concrete. You know what? That guy told me nothing. He owes everybody money, and John Capon is no longer, at least publicly, selling his wine. And that's when I started to see, you know, lists fly across the country from different brokers and whatnot because Rudy was trying to find other ways to sell, and he did. This is another fake one. After the Poncel auction in 2008, nobody wanted to deal with Rudy's wines. Everybody knew there was a problem. But in 2009, Christie's, of all people, sold wine for Rudy in a series of auctions for him under his own name. You know, the auction houses had gone from having high reputations to having apparently sold tens of millions of dollars worth of counterfeit wines. In 2012, on top of all this, I got a hold of the Spectrum Vanquish catalog. They had brand new labels. They had the pink wax. We all looked at it and all said, yeah, absolutely, this is Rudy's wine. Spectrum wouldn't withdraw them, and they wouldn't disclose it was from Rudy. At that point, I went and published uh, a warning. Boy, did this go viral. There were a number of different labeling issues that were basically called to our attention. One of them involved a strip label for an importer, Percy Fox, that had a misspelling of his address, a Sackville Street with two E's, and it should have been with an L and an E. FBI agents came here and were talking pretty seriously. I could tell by their line of questioning that they were zeroing in on him. They were serious about it. I said, you're barking up the wrong tree. Rudy could never do what you think he has done because he just doesn't have the capacity to do it. And after they left, I, I went to the phone and I called him. As a friend, I thought I should warn him. I remember his very words. I said, the FBI was just here, Rudy, and I think they're really seriously I can tell the last time they came, they were just asking. This time, they're, 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 there's something serious going on, and I just want to let you know. And he said, don't worry, dude. It's, I have everything under control. Those were his very words. Don't worry, dude. I have everything under control. I don't think there was any reason to think he knew we were coming. We meet on the morning of the 8th, somewhere around 5 o'clock. 
the plan was to approach the house, set up a perimeter, knock and announce, and place him under arrest. We pulled up, and agents went to their designated positions, and they proceeded to knock and announce, and knock and announce, and knock and announce, and yell and yell, and there was no answer. The team leader said, get the ram, and I thought, oh no, this is gonna be a long day. And then the door opened, and it was Rudy, and he looked like he had just gotten out of bed. When you walked in the house, the first thing you saw was wine everywhere in the living room and a huge wine refrigerator. I was stunned. I mean, I could have been knocked over with a feather when I saw what was in the kitchen. In the kitchen sink, there were two or three bottles soaking. The labels were being soaked off the bottles. There were two or three bottles sitting next to the kitchen sink waiting to be labeled. There was a cork extraction device. There was a recorking device. There was, in effect, a mixing station of somewhere around 20 bottles sitting in the kitchen, all sorts of California wines. And there were notations. Change the year, the vintage, change the size, remove a serial number. We found bottles that were unlabeled that had handwritten notations like formulas. There were labels and labels and labels, thousands of labels, banded like US currency. The thermostat was set at like 63 degrees. And in this million dollar house, they used space heaters in the two bedrooms where they slept. In a storeroom, there were racks and racks of wine. And on the treadmill, there were 18 waiting to be labeled. There was a stencil. There were old wooden crates throughout the house. There were boxes with real labels, like a library. There was everything you'd ever need to make fake wine. As an FBI agent, if I had listed the 10 things that I would have liked to have obtained from a search, this was 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 to infinity. I don't know what all that stuff was doing there. It's very odd, right? I can't picture, they didn't find printing presses, they didn't find, they just found stuff. They found no stuff to make wax caps. Nothing that, no means of production, just stuff. So what's that stuff doing there? Is he looking at it? Is he giving it to someone? Is someone giving it to him to look at? I don't know. I did not, I could not believe. I couldn't believe it. That can't be Rudy. being a very close friend of his. I got calls. And then I saw the pictures. He was the last, he is the last person I would ever suspect of being able to do any kind of intensive arts and crafts. I left you a message, just so you know. No, I didn't, I didn't get it. The I number that it. I have for you, I called. It's still there, but I, I, changed, I just changed a new phone, you see? He is ADD. He doesn't have the attention span. Live is good, live is good. <laughs> live is good, man. It's a time-consuming, laborious thing to do, and he could, he could never do that. I just could not see him doing it, and I still don't see him doing it, and I still don't believe he did it. No way. Uh... I think part of what uh, he started doing was uh, doing some reconditioning. If you want to take everything they're saying is true, for purposes of argument, and again, I'm not stipulating that, but if you want to take everything they're saying is true, um, we're talking about wine here. Oh, my God. 91 Rich Montebello. Did you want it? Here's a, a, a wine over here, something that people have tasted that they're saying is the best ever. Well, if you can make something taste like that, 
why not recreate that experience? And I think that, uh, uh, I think that's what happened. They tried to uh, make that sound like it was alchemy, you know, like he was mixing and matching and, and contriving. It, but that's not what I think it was at all. Um, I think Rudy just really digs wine. Oh, this is, uh... Why is Rudy? Yeah. We're all that? insecure. Be okay. I go, man. That's it, man. That's That's awesome. And if we're the new kid in the group, we're really insecure. And especially if everybody else in the group is older, if everybody else in the group is richer, you want to live up to whatever the expectations are. The only government evidence was relating to something that would have been a couple of bottles at a time, perhaps being made in the kitchen sink uh, in Rudy's house in Arcadia. Uh, I don't think that you could have created the number of bottles they claimed that were counterfeit doing that. So they have a problem with that. This bottle, 1985 Cote Rotie La Moline, is from the famous, the famous crazy wine auction, the cellar auction, where all the shit happened, Rudy's auction. The cellar was Rudy's cellar. And you will see this is very real. So this is an example of 90% of Rudy's wine that he sold that is real. It's fantastic, as you, everyone's going to see. Yeah, this one is real. So um, he did <laughs> sell mostly real wine, I think. He had. An incredible palate, and he was also oh very God, generous. This is so good. He was incredible. It's rare and perfect. Do you want to use a fork because it's on camera? No, I'm just going to do good. my hands. Okay, yeah, go good. for it. Mm. Let's do it. Here we go. Thank you very much. Hi, Matthew. How, How are, are you, babe? Everything's good. How are those wines? Fucking awesome. Are you just walking down the street drinking wine? Uh, no, we, we took a car here. Oh. We are uh, not able to drive right now, so we had a driver. This is one of the ones that uh, Rudy sold. Try this, please. It's outstanding. It's as good as it gets. It does taste really good. Thank you so much. Christian, so this is a, a bottle that uh, Levy bought from Rudy. It's real. He bought it from... How, how, long, how long has this been open? About two hours. You don't this like it? Fretzel. You think it's fake? <laughs> really? I know this wine very well. It's not even close. It doesn't have the life, doesn't have the, the verve and the velocity of, and, the, and the dimension of a La Moulin 85, which is almost like if you had a really rich uh, BLT with the egg on top, that's how that wine tastes almost. This, I mean, it tastes like, you know, skunk juice. So that's very interesting. How much of the Rudy wine do you have? I don't know. Six bottles or something. He is 6,000 <laughs> bottles. <laughs> There's a kind of collaboration between the forger and the dupe. People kind of want to be fooled. You really want to own this very rare bottle of wine that maybe, maybe doesn't even exist anymore. And so you don't really want to know that it's a fake. <laughs> If you believe that Rudy Kurniawan was just trying to recondition the bottles and give them a nicer appearance, then you probably believe that in a few weeks, a man with a white beard is going to come down your chimney and leave a case of 1945 Romani Conti under your tree. I became interested in this investigation when I met Jim Wynn, the FBI agent assigned to it. I sensed right away that there was going to be an actual charge that could be made. We certainly had overwhelming evidence. A connoisseur of counterfeiting who mastered label making, cork stamping. He had been purchasing things like extremely large quantities, thousands of dollars of wax. He was ordering paper that was known for its antique properties that can be used to make labels. 
he was collecting dozens and dozens of empty bottles from restaurants. I always keep my empty bottles, you know that. And people ask me why. I actually put the date and the place that I had where, you know, and who I had with, and kind of simple notes at the back of the bottle. Rudy's explanation was that he was creating a museum of some kind, or he was doing a photo shoot of some kind. He was scanning labels into his computer, and then he was printing them on a huge printer that was in the house. What I'm doing is forensically looking at the wines. After having scanned through and cataloged all the evidence from Rudy's computers, what I can say is this is definitely Rudy's because here's the template that made it. There are notebooks upon notebooks in evidence of Rudy's tasting notes. One of the really interesting pieces of evidence I thought was a half bottle that had writing on it. And he had M45 and he had a, a, a formula. So that was 1945 Mouton. And he had his first formula that he had blended and he didn't like that. He had that scribbled out and then on the other side he had another formula for M45 that he liked better. So I, I think that it was a lot of trial and error and it was a lot of blending. He would take these old wines that he had tasted once. He found other wines that had similar characteristics, and they just mad scientist it. What he would make was generally a very convincing imitation of what it said on the label. It's easy to dismiss all this. It's, oh, these guys are sniffing and swirling, and, and it's all a crock of shit, and you could, you know, you could fool. Well, the fact is, most of these guys, you couldn't fool them most of the time. That's what's interesting about Rudy's fraud, is that hardly anybody could have done it. He was a bit of an artist. Okay, this one which is dirty on the side and not in the middle. It was well done, actually, but too much well done because there is nearly um, uh, a line between the dirt and the non-dirt. My theory is easy. To fake one bottle, you need one hour. If you have the labels, the wax and everything, just to uh, eliminate the original label, the capsule, and then clean it, put the new label on it, dirt it, Again, put the wax and everything. It takes one hour. When you know that one of the big sale was 15,000 bottles or something like that, if you multiply the number of bottles by one hour, 15,000 hours. So, so it's impossible. I mean, technically, it's impossible that he could do it. He, he could have done it uh, on his own. We know that some of the paper came from Indonesia. His brothers were in Indonesia. We knew that there was money going to his brothers in Indonesia. It was, it was pretty evident to us that this was kind of a family affair. Are you independently no. wealthy? What? Are you independently wealthy? No, I'm broke. No, no, no. no I'm, I'm trying to... I scam people to drink your wife. When we spoke to witnesses and when we conducted our investigation, one thing that was pretty consistent was that no one really knew the source of his purported wealth and no one actually knew his background. His legally registered name is Rudy Kernewan, um, but he has operated under different names. He operated under the name Lin Wadi Tan, or Lenny Tan, which is actually his mother's name. Uh, to answer your question, I, you I, come from a, I come from a wealthy family. Good for The names for Rudy Kernewan and his brother, Dar Saputra, those are both the names of famous Indonesian badminton players. His father gave him that name uh, because it is an Indonesian name. 
Rudy was of Chinese descent, and there's a period of time when there was a, a huge amount of, of even danger to people of Chinese descent that were living in Indonesia. The family was reasonably well-to-do and involved in a number of business I interests, and they've been successful. They're, they're fairly reserved in terms of talking uh, about much about the family. I come from a wealthy family. Good work. This guy, he's, he's recreating himself. <laughs> it's, just, it's like he was in the witness protection program. In Indonesia, everybody is given an identity card, and we were able to pull his passports, and we knew that his father's name was Mac Moore Wujojo, and that his mother was Lenwadi Tan. And then we knew he had a brother, Dar, and he had a brother, Teddy. And then we were able to find their Facebook pages. They weren't hiding their conspicuous consumption. Who backed him? Where did his money come from? Who created him? We started receiving information through sources in the banking community and in the business community in Jakarta that there was a link between Lenwadi Tan's brothers uh, being involved in the largest bank heist in the history of Jakarta. Kejaksaan Agung belum mampu melakukan ekstradisi terhadap buronan pembobol bank Bapindo Edi Tansil. Walaupun keberadaan Edi sudah diketahui berada di Cina. One of them is Edi Tansil, who's still a fugitive in China. Edi broke out of prison and escaped after stealing all the proceeds of a bank. Buron penggelapan uang sebesar 565 juta dolar Amerika yang didapat dari kredit bank Bapindo tersebut. And the other brother, Henra Raharja, had a bank, Harapan Sentosa, and he walked away with hundreds of millions of dollars. He just stole it and then fled to Australia. Hendra Rahaja, he's accused of Indonesia's biggest corporate fraud, defrauding $670 million. This is uh, really painful, you know, for us, for all the clients of the banks. I saved my money for about 30 years. One of the properties that Hendrik Raharja claimed to own was Jalan Galamaja. And I was like, whoa, this is the coincidence. It's just, uh, you know, I don't believe in coincidences. Our governments and people of Indonesia call on all Rahaja's family members and associates to come clean and surrender themselves to account for their grotesque crimes. Do you have any indication of where the money might be? Is it in bank accounts or is it in property? Or is it... Well, I don't want to signal uh, our shots in that regard, but we do believe that there are assets overseas. Oh, I'm going to meet somebody at 12.30 in Westwood, so I could... I don't know if Rudy was benefiting from Eddie Tanzel and his mother's family's thievery. Maybe that's why the backstory was created when he came to the United States. Once this guy was a rock star in the world of rare, expensive wine. And now Rudy Kurniawan is on trial for fraud here in New York, accused of making millions selling counterfeit wines to unsuspecting... I don't want to be away from the trail. When Rudy will be in front of me, eyes into eyes, I want to let him know that I know what he has done. And it's not a satisfaction that someone goes to jail, but this is so important for Burgundy. 
if Rudy at the end of the trial is free. I, I can't believe in anything anymore in life. Maybe I will become a monk. <laughs> I'm worried. Uh, I don't know what will happen. I'm in America, I'm French, and I have to make my testimony in English. It makes me a little nervous. He turned his home into a wine factory, said prosecutor Joseph Facciaponte of the defendant, and created what he called his magic cellar. He decided to plead not guilty. Sometimes, certainly in the area of financial fraud, there are defendants who basically don't want to accept reality. They choose not to acknowledge it. When I got into the room, I found him a little uh, slimmer. He lost weight in prison, probably. It's, it's never uh, uh, something you can like when you see someone on the ground. The Sherlock Holmes of French wine. Laurent Ponceau's crusade to sniff out the fraudster who was faking his vintage wines began about five years ago and ended here at Manhattan's Federal District Court this week. At a certain point of uh, my testimony, our eyes for once get in touch and he smiled to me, and he, he, ma he made me a little sign uh, with his head and, and smiled to me. And I found it uh, uh, bizarre, but, but in the meantime, nice. The first person ever to be convicted for selling fake wine in the U.S. will spend the next 10 years bottled up in a jail cell. Fraudster Rudy Kurniawan will also pay $28.4 million back to victims. Hi, what's your reaction to the, to the trial today? Very surprised, uh, stunned, I think. Uh, we did not expect the judge to impose a sentence at that length. Rudy has apologized to the New York judge, saying wine became my life and I lost myself in it an obsession that will be hard to pursue from behind bars. I've had organized crime cases with dead bodies for less time. That's the truth. Dead bodies less time. Yeah. The harm that was actually done in this case does not justify the kind of sentence that was handed out. It just doesn't. But he didn't profit from the crime as much as other people did. And the people who profited the most from his crime are living large and drinking great wine and they're not in jail and then they get, you know. Others have suggested that there are additional people that should be prosecuted, but to bring a criminal prosecution, it's not enough to say that they were negligent. You have to prove that they intended to defraud someone by lying to them or making misrepresentations. It's kind of like a game of musical chairs and Rudy was the last one standing when the, when the music stopped. not the real end of the fakers. If I go on investigating, I will find more people doing this, but I'm gonna stop. I want to focus again on my job to produce authentic wines. Nous sommes réunis ce soir pour jouer la finale d'une symphonie dont j'ai l'honneur d'être le chef d'orchestre. Mais un chef d'orchestre, il n'est rien sans les musiciens. Chacun d'entre vous a coupé l'équivalent de 2000 bouteilles. Je dois vous remercier pour votre patience, votre travail et votre joie de vivre. Nous avons joué ensemble une musique harmonieuse et raffinée. Un, deux... La 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 la
is the largest uh, wine seizure the U.S. Marshals have ever handled. Behind you, we have over 500 bottles that have been deemed counterfeit from uh, Rudy Trujillo Wines private collection. I have no doubt that it's going to take years or decades or maybe never to fully filter out all of Rudy Cornillo Wines' fake wines. It's impossible to identify every single person who has one of those bottles. <laughs> You know, more scrupulous collectors have just bitten the bullet and they've written off a bunch of stuff. John Cabon, to his credit, has, has, you know, anything questionable he has taken back and uh, he's refunded a lot of people's money. Right. But I think a lot of people probably don't want to know that their sellers are full of fakes, and so they're just, it's still out there. You know? For the best of Chile and Argentina, and the rest, 160. They'll circulate. If you buy this, you will almost certainly get laid. All right? You're going to start me, sir. But at what price? $10,000. I don't look at wine catalogs anymore. I throw them in the wastebasket. $200,000. This whole industry has a pomp and circumstance to it. You're either a believer or an apostate. Cheers, guys. You want some beer? You want some beer? <laughs> like, dare you say the emperor has no clothes? It's just liquid. It's wine. But it's become a commodity. <sighs> some of the biggest CEOs of corporate America they all were duped by this guy. The moral to this story, in my opinion, is that when you leave things unregulated, you allow the wolves to come in and, and game the system. And this system had been gamed. When I first discovered this case of wine that he sold me was fake, I was very hurt. And I felt like a fool, too. I felt foolish. But the number of amazing experiences I had with him far outweigh any anger I could have. So I forgave, you know? I forgave that. When I think about him, and I think about him quite a bit, that I just cannot put two and two together. I just can't, because it's just like talking about Black and white. Oh, I have not tried, but I would love to see him. One day, I hope I'll be able to sit down with him. I don't know. I'll just tell him what was this all about.